I was having a look through Linux security news and I came across an article from ZDNet that I could actually agree with. Enough with the Linux security FUD, the fear, uncertainty and doubt. So every few weeks there's another security story saying how insecure Linux is. There's only one problem with most of them, they're fake news. The real problem is incompetent system administrators. Now I don't think it's just the administrators that are at fault. There are issues with open source code. However, the issues are generally not that severe and rely upon something else going wrong or rely upon an attacker having physical access to the system. And by the time you've got physical access to the system, you can do anything with it. So generally, most of the issues in Linux are not actually that bad. And this is why I don't even go through most of them these days, because they're just not even worthwhile discussing. They're completely blown out of all proportion and just not worth it like there's many more things to talk about or more things to do and some of the vulnerabilities just deserve to be completely ignored no matter what weird naming convention they come up with for them what you'll find is some of these what they think are really bad linux vulnerabilities they give actual names to rather than just going with the cve number the common vulnerabilities exposure number so they think oh we'll give it a a weird name and maybe it will uh, impact people more and think how bad Linux and all these operating systems are. Yeah, whatever, just before I start this article, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, what I think are actually the really bad vulnerabilities that we've had in Linux. And they're not new. Some of the things I'm going to talk about are really not new at all. So back in 2014, that there was a vulnerability in Bash known as Shellshock. So Bash could unintentionally execute commands when commands are concatenated to the end of function definition that's stored in values of environment variables. And within days of the publication, a variety of related vulnerabilities were discovered. So a series of patches were needed, but the result of Shellshock meant that many botnets were created and could be used to attack and leverage the vulnerability further and it was used quite heavily against websites that relied upon bash in some way and you would find bash commands being passed as parameters to websites and that still goes on to this day so six years after the bug was discovered this is still potentially a problem although any systems that are have been around for six years and not been patched, uh, generally coming few and far between. But the fact that these vulnerabilities are still attempted to this day is quite surprising. And another one from 2014 was Heartbleed. The Heartbleed bug is a security vulnerability in the popular OpenSSL cryptographic software library. This weakness allows for stealing the information protected under normal conditions by the SSL TLS encryption used to secure the internet. So yes, this was an internet-wide problem. So SSL TLS provides a communication, security, and privacy over internet applications such as web, email, instant messaging, as well as most websites this day and age, but yeah. The Heartbleed bug allows anyone on the internet to read the memory of systems protected by vulnerable versions of OpenSSL software. This comprises the secret keys used to identify the service providers and to encrypt the traffic, the names and passwords of users and the actual content. This allows attackers to eavesdrop on communications, steal data directly from the servers. That was a massive flaw and it showed just how poorly maintained OpenSSL was compared to how crucial it was for the whole internet. Things have changed quite rapidly since then, and I don't think any of this is a problem in this day and age. But what still remains a problem is SSH servers. Poor passwords of SSH servers rather than a specific vulnerability against them. So a few years ago, I ran an exposed SSH server on the internet and gathered the passwords that were attempted against it. And yeah, fairly predictable back then. And we even had an article from the SANS this is, again, going back quite a few years, showing the issue of the vulnerable IoT devices, the Internet of TAT devices. This particular article was about DVRs that had predictable passwords, and they actually did a test with a vulnerable DVR server. Oh, sorry, not a server, a vulnerable DVR device that had, uh, well, I suppose it, 
is not the worst password ever, except they were manufactured with that password, so it was a useless password. To test how bad it is to expose a DVR to an internet connection, I did just that. I used an old DVR I had sitting around from the last DVR malware episode and connected it to my normal cable modem internet connection. I captured all packets going in and out of the system and kept watching to make sure it wouldn't be used to attack other systems. The sad part is I didn't have to wait long. The IP address was hit by telnet attempts pretty much every minute. Instead of having to wait for a long time to see an attack, my problem was the DVR was often overwhelmed by the attacks and the Telnet server stopped responding. I had to reboot it every few minutes. So that shows just how much of a problem it is with SSH and Telnet with predictable passwords. And all those articles I showed there were very old. So how are things this day and age? Well, we had the recent boot hold that sounded downright scary. You could get root access on any system. Oh no, look again. The group that discovered it comes right out and says an attacker needs admin access in order for their exploit to do its dirty work. <laughs> so if you have root access to the system, you already have real trouble. Yeah, and if you have physical access to the system, it's not very difficult to get the password reset. I showed in a two minute video how to reset an Ubuntu password. It takes that short a length of time if you have physical access to the system. If you don't have physical access to the system, then that will not work. And you're then reliant upon poor passwords being the real issue rather than a particular vulnerability with the software. In another recent case, the FBI and NSA released a security alert about a Russian malware, Doverub. This program used unsigned kernel modules to attack systems. Although the malware can only attack Linux distributions running the kernel 3.6 or earlier. And guess what? The Linux kernel 3.6 was released eight years ago. I suppose if you're still running some obsolete Red Hat Enterprise Linux version 6, you might have to worry but uh, I wouldn't put it past some enterprises to still have some of those kicking around. Or Ubuntu 12.04. Let's make a little list of the top production Linux distros. CentOS Red Hat Enterprise Linux version 7 started with kernel 3.10. Debian 8 started with kernel 3.16. Ubuntu 13.04 started with kernel 3.8. SUSE Linux 12.3 started with kernel 3.7.10. All these years old distros started out life immune to the attack. And all recent versions are invulnerable to this malware. Great. <laughs> so that goes back even further than those uh, shell shock and heart bleed issues I talked about at the beginning of the video. Any Linux distributions that old are likely to be vulnerable to those issues. Let's look at another example, Doki, a new backdoor Trojan. This time around, although described by many as a Linux problem, it's not. It can only successfully attack Linux systems when whoever set up Docker containers exposed the management interface API on the internet. Yeah, that's dumb. So if you opened up firewall port TCP 2375 to the internet, you have more issues than just this item of malware. And if you did happen to open it up, but are not running Docker, then you're not going to be affected by that issue. So yes, it relies upon having the software and the open port on the firewall. Finally, let's consider the recent sudo command problem. Wait, which one's that they're talking about? Uh, oh, the potential bypass of run as user restrictions. So. Oh yeah, this was the wraparound of the unsigned integer issue. So this was another one that uh, relied upon having physical access to the system or, or having quite a significant toehold that you're able to run these commands. If you're able to get this much of a toehold in the system, then you're more than likely going to be hit by something, whether it was sudo run as issue or anything else. And anyway, that's uh, got a CVE of... Uh, 2019, I think I noticed there. 
Yeah, CVE 2019 14287. So again, this is uh, it's been around for a little while and probably wasn't that much of an issue at the time. In this case, you had to misconfigure sudo setup so that any user could theoretically run sudo. Once again, if you already have an insecure system, it can always get worse. Now, whether you're running Windows Server, Linux, NetBSD, or whatever on your mission critical systems, if you utterly fail at security, it doesn't matter how secure your operating system is, it's like leaving your car keys in an unlocked car. Your system will be hacked and your car will be stolen. So enough with blaming Linux, let's blame the real problem, simple system administrator incompetence. So that was an interesting news story to read, and I think it sums it up with uh, my opinion of a lot of these news stories, that they are blown completely out of proportion, and it is spreading FUD. It's spreading misinformation about Linux, and if these vulnerabilities are really not much of an issue or rely upon years old, outdated products that are really not my, not in existence these days, then like, so what? Uh, and I don't care that Linux from 10 years ago had a vulnerability, like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just, it's not of interest and it's not really a concern in this day and age. But there we go. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all later.